Thank you for that nice, uh, nice introduction. Last night I went to a reception where the food and wine flowed freely. And uh, I asked how many people we really expected to show up at 8 a.m. for the morning keynote. I was told that if you're from the East Coast, attendance is mandatory. From the Central Time Zone, it's optional, and the people from the Pacific Time Zone can sleep in. <coughs> but I think uh, I think uh, the Californians have uh, shown up, although we don't know. Maybe some of those East Coasters are in bed too. Um, so what I want to talk about today, actually, it kind of follows on that theme of the reception. Uh, when I woke up this morning, uh, I. I wondered uh, about the following question. Which day of the week do you suppose are the most searches for hangover? Now let me ask the audience's opinion. I know you like data. Uh, how many people say uh, Sunday? And how many people say Monday? And how many people say Tuesday? Now we have a few party animals here. <laughs> But uh, how would you find the answer? Well, the way you'd find the answer, of course, is you would go to Google. And uh, in this particular case, what you do is you go to a little tool that we put together, a tool called Google Search Insights. And here's a picture of it. This is Insights for Search. And what I did is I put in Hangover, and I said the United States, and I put in a time range, and I said I want to look at web search. And here you see this very, very regular cycle that peaks every Sunday. And what is this? That's January 1st. <laughs> so I want to emphasize, with everything I'm going to talk about today, kids, you can do this at home. You don't need mom and dad's permission. You can take that data, download it as a CSV file, and then play around with it, merge it with your own data, and do all sorts of analysis built on top of it. Now, not only can you look at a single query, the way I did here, but you can actually look at the geographic distribution. Here's New York, that's the hangover capital. <laughs> and you can see up here, either people don't get hangovers or they don't complain about them, I'm not sure. Here you can see the top searches in this area, and here are the rising searches, so you've got this wealth of, uh, of information about whatever topic you choose. You can look at multiple queries. So here's an example where I looked at hangover and vodka, and here's vodka peaking every Saturday on December 31st, and there's a hangover peaking every Sunday. So I'm not sure if we want to consider this causality or just mere correlation, but in any event, it's an interesting source for, for data. So, um, give you one more example. I know there are many academics in the audience. So here, if we look at the searches for civil war, you see this very, very regular series of civil war searches. And you might ponder why that is. In smaller groups, I sometimes ask. People think maybe it's holidays, or maybe it's vacations, or maybe it's uh, so. But it, turns out is here, if you look at just fitting a very, very simple, it's an autoregressive, seasonal autoregressive model, I fit to the data, you can predict those searches for civil war just uh, phenomenally well. Uh, turns out that what's going on is you see this peak right here? That peak is three days before the term paper is due. <laughs> and how do I know? How do I know that's three days before the term paper is due? Because if I look at the searches for term papers, and I look at the searches for civil war, they align pretty much perfectly. <laughs> I urge you to try your own field, try a few technical terms from your own field, and I think you might see uh, the same sort of phenomenon happening there. Although I do believe your students are probably a little more responsible, so maybe it's four or five days before the term papers do. All right, so as you can see, you can get some insight into human behavior, and what I want to talk about today is using this data, this data from Google, to look at economic issues. So we're going to try to predict the present. You know, Yogi Bear said prediction is hard, especially about the future. We're going to lower the bar a little bit, just trying to predict the present, because most of the cases you'll see contemporaneous correlation between the queries and the events we're trying to look at. 
but it's still very, very valuable to predict the present because the data is typically released with a rather long lag, several weeks, and it's often revised. <coughs> Some data is only available on a quarterly basis. So having high frequency data is very valuable for doing uh, economic research. And there's a couple of papers you can get from the Google uh, research website that go, go into this in, in more detail. The idea is to take some uh, economic index, feed in a model, usually based on lag, some kind of autoregressive model, uh, feed in some other exogenous variables, and feed in this data from Google uh, Search Insights, and uh, see if we can improve predictive performance. Now, notice I used the term here, Google Trends. There's actually two websites. One is Google Insights for Search, and the other is Google Trends, but it's the same back end, it's the same data, it's just one is a more powerful interface than the other. The one you want is the Google Insights for Search, and that allows you to download the data and merge it with your own uh, series. So um, here's our recommended procedure for using that data. Fit the best model you can using the data you have, and that'll often be just the time series itself, some kind of univariate model. Uh, you usually estimate seasonal and trend components. Add in that Google data as an additional predictor, in many cases a contemporaneous predictor. Obviously, if you're looking at historical data from the time series itself, you can only use the past values. Google data would often be contemporaneous. And then what we do is we look at the one step ahead uh, forecast, and typically I'll use mean absolute error. You can use whatever metric you want but we're looking at the out of sample one step ahead forecast. And everybody who's looked at economic data knows that if the series goes like this, it's easy to forecast. If it goes like this, it's easy to forecast. The tough thing is picking out the turning points. So the turning points are typically the most interesting aspect of the series. Now, if you uh, want to use this data, there are a few things you have to recognize. One, you've got to look at this mixed frequency problem because the data from Google is available on a daily or weekly basis and a lot of economic time series are only available on a monthly or quarterly basis so there's a few subtleties in <coughs> using that, uh, that data but of course it's a big plus because having higher frequency data as your predictor is, is quite attractive. Secondly is an index so when I showed you that data on uh, hangover, what that was, was it was the queries that involved the term hangover divided by the total number of queries in that region, in that time period. So it's a normalized query share, and it's used as what we call broad match, that is, uh, terms that just contain the uh, query in question. And uh, we use the query share, we normalize it to be 100, uh, at the maximum point during the observation period. Furthermore, there's a privacy filter there. There have to be around 50 distinct queries from different IP addresses to show up in the database, so we don't have very idiosyncratic uh, queries will not appear. It's sample data, so in order to get real-time uh, response from that system, it's a sample, but it's a reasonable size sample and it changes by a few percent from day to day. Uh, your queries are cached, so if you repeat the same query, you'll get the same data back in a given day, but it'll be slightly different in uh, subsequent days. If you want to get rid of that, just, just query over five, six days, and then average it, and you'll basically get rid of that sampling variation. And then finally, the last point is you might want to look at this in a context. So you can look at the context of related queries. There's a big difference, for example, between Apple as part of queries in the food and drink category and Apple as part of queries in the consumer electronics category. And for that matter, there's Apple Music, which is in the entertainment category. So you can disambiguate these terms by restricting your search to given category. Here's an example. This is Apple in the food and drink category which again has that very, very strong seasonality that peaks every November. And then here's Apple in the consumer electronics category. We see this peak around Christmas every year. This is a popular Christmas present. And then you also see various bumps when product announcements and so on are made. So think about the terms that you're looking for 
one good thing to do is to try to search in their in their relevant category to make sure that you've got uh, you have you don't have ambiguous uh, ambiguous terms. All right, so I think that's all I have to say about search insights. Oh, and yes, last thing is you can also look at searches just by category alone. So in this case, I'm not using any term, but I'm saying look in the category vehicle shopping, which would be a whole set of terms that are related to vehicle shopping. Here's what it looks like. It kind of trundles along. We see the recession, and then we see the Cash for Clunkers program, which happened in the uh, summer of uh, 2009. Big, big surge in the vehicle shopping queries to that particular event. The um, Council of Economic Advisors actually wrote a study trying to determine the incremental purchases associated with cash for clunkers because everybody recognizes there's some uh, intertemporal shifting of consumption here. And one of the questions they ask us is, is when did people first start searching on the term cash for clunkers? Because that get, would give you an idea of when you might have an impact from, the, uh, from that program. Um, all right. So that's enough background. Let's get to the uh, application. And the uh, first one is unemployment, obviously a very important issue these days. The uh, particular measure of unemployment that economists are quite uh, that focus on is this initial claims for uh, unemployment benefits. That's the black line in this chart. And then the red line, which is the unemployment rate, which is reported on a monthly basis, is also shown. The gray bars are recessions. And if you stare at that graph for a few minutes, you'll see a kind of interesting point. The initial claims for unemployment benefits peak right at the end of a recession. So they are the best single indicator for the end of a recession. And then the uh, unemployment uh, rate, that tends to peak a few months after the initial claims peak. So the initial claims is like water flowing into the sink, and the unemployment rate is about the level of water in the sink, and then of course people getting jobs, and it's like water draining out, and so it's not too surprising when you see that uh, relationship. Of course, I will tell you one little secret, Economists get to define the end of a recession themselves, and one of the things they look at is the initial claims. So maybe it's not quite as uh, striking as you might uh, think at first glance. But uh, nevertheless, it's a, it's a very uh, important economic indicator. It's released every Thursday by the Bureau of uh, Labor Statistics. And if you go to Google, uh, insights for search here, and we look at the category for welfare and unemployment related searches, you see it has pretty much the same uh, general shape. I'll give you a better graph in a minute. But it's not too surprising because what would you do if you were laid off? The first thing you do is you go to Google and you say, how do I apply for unemployment benefits? How do I file for unemployment benefits? Where's the unemployment office? How long does unemployment last? You'd want to know all those questions, so it's not too surprising you see a contemporaneous, cor contemporaneous correlation between those queries and then the actual uh, filings. <clears throat> These are three of the categories that we have that are related to jobs, welfare, and unemployment, and job listings. And you can see they're the kinds of questions that would be quite natural for people to uh, ask if they were either uh, looking for work they become unemployed, and of course this is the demand side of the labor market firms who are looking for employees, mostly in this case temp uh, workers, which of course itself is another <coughs> useful uh, economic indicator. So here <coughs> I show two plots. One is the uh, initial claims in black, and the, <coughs> the, the blue line is the uh, welfare and unemployment category, and in the lower graph, the blue line, is the query filing for unemployment. <clears throat> this is uh, allergy season in California, so uh, for, please forgive me if I uh, cough a little bit. But uh, notice that these weekly, these, uh, in, in these claims for unemployment benefits seem to have a really strong relationship to the actual uh, filings. So uh, I estimate a little baseline model. In this case, uh, I just look at a simple autoregressive model of uh, order one. 
And that gives you a mean absolute error for the one step ahead forecast of about 3.27%. If I throw in as an additional predictor this filing for unemployment uh, query, then the mean absolute error goes down by a little bit. Uh, if I use a rolling window forecast where I train for T weeks and then forecast uh, week T plus one, so I'm always doing an out of sample forecast, estimating up to given week and then forecasting the next week, uh, again, we see that the mean absolute error of the baseline is about 3.3% with the query 3.2%, so we get a, a small improvement. But just using exactly that same model, looking during the, the recession, when we're seeing this peak and uh, subsequent decline, we end up with a mean absolute error for the, uh, with the query uh, substantially lower than what we get with the baseline. In fact, we get about a 9.3% improvement in terms of that one step ahead uh, forecast. So that's uh, maybe not uh, a phenomenal improvement, but getting a 9% improvement in your forecasting accuracy by just including this one additional variable uh, is in fact uh, is useful, I believe. Uh, and this is what the pictures look like. If we look at the actual, this is the black line, that's the initial pledge for unemployment, and the base forecast, which is a simple autoregressive model, is the red line, and then the green line is using that query, and it particularly helps up here in the uh, turning point, which occurred back in April of, uh, of 2009. Another example for destination planning, this is uh, travel to Hong Kong. Turns out uh, the Hong Kong Tourism Board posts uh, every month a summary of visitors from different uh, uh, countries. And that's one of, the, uh, one of the vacation destinations that Google tracks in its category data, Hong Kong. So we just plot the visitors to Hong Kong along with the Google data, you can see there's pretty common seasonality. These series obviously have something to do with each other. If you build a little model, and again, we're just going to use the simplest model, in this case, a seasonal autoregressive model, where we look at visitors uh, in month T uh, as a function of visitors a month before and 12 months before, and then we throw in as an additional predictor the Google queries two weeks into the month, so the data is released with about a month <coughs> lag, so we're looking six weeks ahead in terms, of the, uh, in terms of when the data becomes available, then we uh, get a pretty nice forecast of, of what the visitors look like to Hong Kong from each of these different countries. Now this is actually quite a quite useful for other kinds of destination planning. We looked, for example, at the impact of the oil spill in Florida. So the Gulf oil spill had a big impact on tourism in Florida, but mostly what it did is it shifted people from the west coast of Florida to the east coast of Florida. You can see that uh, quite clearly in the query data uh, a couple months before it actually occurred because people were doing vacation planning several months before actually taking their vacation. So it was a, I think, a, a kind of a useful uh, exercise to go through. OK, so there are many other examples in the paper. I don't have time to go through them all. But the uh, essential point is we've got hundreds of category predictors for economic times series, millions of uh, query predictors. You can find terms that are useful in predicting an economic time series you generally get 5 to 15 percent improvement in this one step ahead uh, out of sample forecast. It works best for consumer related things because it's consumers that are using uh, Google to type the queries. Business to business uh, data doesn't show up in, uh, in such a strong way. But the big plus is it's very, very easy to acquire and work with this data. Anybody can go to that Google Search Insights website, explore the queries, find things that are potentially predictors of what they're interested in, and uh, download it and, and start, start working. So the methodological questions that come up are how should you select the predictors, how should you make the forecast, how should you evaluate the performance, then how do you handle this mixed frequency issue that I alluded to a few minutes ago. So this is part of a general 
set of questions, I think, that uh, are, uh, arise or, or, or were foreseen, I guess is the right uh, term, by uh, Herb Simon, who's kind of the patron saint of uh, information economics. And way back in the 70s, he said this a wonderful quote, a wealth of information creates a poverty of attention and a need to allocate that attention among the overabundance of information sources that might consume us. So we thought about this in terms of information overload and all this stuff, but I want to think about it specifically in terms of uh, econometric statistical applications uh, in this talk. Now, I know many of you have used time series data. Not everybody has, so I want to just lay out a few of the issues that you have to look at if you're looking at time series. In our examples, we have 90 or 95 monthly observations. So Google data goes back to 2004. Uh, we can't get more data. That's, we can't get a higher frequency. The data is what it is. So it's a small data application in one sense. Uh, there's only 90, 95 observations. Uh, the structure evolves a bit over time, so it's not necessarily stationary. Uh, unlike cross-sectional data, it, you know, it's not IID, past values of an observation are almost always predictive of the future values, either because of seasonal reasons or because of trends. Uh, the natural baseline, when I compare the predictive accuracy of a model in a uh, cross-sectional context, I usually look at a constant, you know, how much do my regressors improve the prediction. In this case, you generally want to look at some naive uh, autoregressive model of one sort or another and ask how much better you can do by using a set of predictors than just by doing uh, straight extrapolation. And uh, typically there's very, very high contemporaneous correlation for economic data. There's also things that we've done at Google looking at epi epidemiological data. For example, we have a service called Flu Trends, which is trying to predict incidence of the flu by looking at flu symptoms. And uh, there, it's not quite so heavily correlated as uh, cross-correlated as you see in economic data. Um, this is very closely related to work that's been done by uh, David Hendry and his collaborators at uh, LSE in Oxford, a term they use called now casting. So central banks are very, very interested in now casting because they have a difficult time uh, try to measure the current state of the economy. Forecasting is hard, I already mentioned that, but even trying to do now casting is hard as well. And there are a lot of uh, issues that arise when you're trying to, to do that. Um, and I want to talk about a few of those issues. Uh, first issue I'm going to talk about is, is what you might call fat regression. So what do you do when you have many possible predictors? And then spurious regression, which comes up a lot in time series. You can have two series that appear to be very highly correlated, but it's just due to common seasonality or trend, and so how do you deal with that? And then finally, the bane of, uh, of our existence when you have all these predictors is this overfitting. How do you ensure that you can uh, get a parsimonious model that allows you to do better out of sample than just throwing in the kitchen sink. Okay, so uh, fat regression. The normal case that we know and love is when we have uh, trying to predict some variable y, we've got a few x variables and our model looks like that. But nowadays in an information rich world, we have far, far more potential regressors than uh, we have observations in many cases. I mean there are you know, hundreds of millions if not billions of queries in that uh, Google search insights. So we've got many possible predictors and we've got uh, just a relatively few observations. And this is, this is the picture I was trying to describe to you. This is a recipe to get a high R squared. Take two helpings of white noise, uh, add in a common trend, add in common seasonality, and then what happens is you can run your regression and uh, uh, you see, you get such a great fit that you immediately run around out and submit your paper. <laughs> so, the problem is having these common uh, seasonality, common trends is uh, a problem for time series. Let me show you using uh, retail sales data. 
This is data, uh, the, the non-seasonally adjusted retail sales data that has this very strong peak every Christmas, big drop in January. You can see the recession right here. It shows up much more strongly if you use the seasonally adjusted data. So here's the seasonally adjusted data where the recession is quite obvious in this data. So if you were to summarize these time series in just simple descriptions, very strong seasonality in retail data, that's the big effect. And uh, the big effect here is uh, the recession. So uh, if you choose predictors, I'm gonna tell you where these come from in a few minutes, but if you just use a sensible way to choose predictors from that Google uh, data, the non-seasonally adjusted data, the best uh, predictor turns out to be queries and apparel. And if you use the seasonally adjusted data, the best predictor turns out to be coupons and rebates. And if you look at this, well, coupons and rebates shows up here too, that's showing price sensitivity. And what happens is when the recession rolls along, people get a lot more interested in finding a deal. So you look at free shipping. Free shipping is very, what rose very dramatically. Uh, during the recession. But down here where you're getting other real economic variables that seem to align with that recession effect, whereas up here, what you tend to get is kind of a hodgepodge of predictors that really are mostly picking up the seasonal effect. And you can see why. Here's the non-seasonally adjusted retail sales, and this is what queries and apparel look like. So the reason this series was chosen as a predictor is because it, uh, correlates very well with this very strong seasonality that you see in the retail sales data. Now, if what you're trying to do is to predict that sales, retail sales will go up at Christmas time, uh, then maybe this is going to be helpful, but we already knew that. I mean, we already know that seasonal pattern. What's important for the economic prediction is really this, uh, finding this recession, they're trying to get maybe some early warning of when the recession starts and when it might be thought of as ending, rather than just trying to predict the seasonality that everybody's well aware of. Uh, this is what happens if you look at the seasonally adjusted retail data, that's here, and then the data from Google on the queries on coupons, which you can see is inversely correlated with the retail sales people have become much more price sensitive during that recession, and that shows up pretty strongly in the data. By the way, that we have another tool that's kind of fun called Google Correlate, and with Google Correlate, what you can do is you can just enter any data series you want, and it'll show you the correlates of it, the queries that are most correlated with it. Well, if, I know you can't read this from the back of the room, but uh, the queries that are most correlated with retail sales, non-seasonally adjusted, are the Oaks, Coral Square, Suburban Square, Pines Mall, it's all malls, basically. Now, just what you would expect, if you're throwing your retail sales at a very strong seasonal effect, indeed, queries on malls are quite uh, predictive of that, that series. So the lesson here is what you care about is the incremental value of possible predictors. You're saying, how much better can I do with this predictor than I could do just using past values of the series itself, which of course would include the uh, seasonality and trend. And for those of you who work in time series, this is an absolutely standard problem. Uh, the recommendation is to whiten or pre-whiten the series. We take out the predictable component and then look and see whether your uh, potential predictor is in fact uh, helps in predicting what you couldn't predict just using the old value of the series. That is, the, whether you can predict the residuals from your uh, simple time series regression. So um, here's this Google Correlate that I mentioned to you a minute ago. Uh, I took the data for initial claims non-seasonally adjusted. So this is not a query, this is the actual data that I just uploaded into this uh, tool and it came back and found those queries that are most highly correlated with it. And the one that was most highly correlated was sign up for unemployment. That's why I used that as a predictor previously. And if you look at uh, Idaho unemployment, Michigan unemployment, unemployment filing, etc. 
Everything looks very sensible until we get down to here to Jack LaLanne Juicer. <laughs> I don't know why Jack LaLanne Juicer is so correlated with initial claims on unemployment, maybe before staying up late at night or something watching late night TV, but uh, pretty much everything else lines up, lines up uh, pretty well. So one thing you can do when you're trying to look at this non-seasonally adjusted data is use this Google Correlate tool. But the warning, you have to be careful because sometimes we'll pick up things that are just pure seasonality. It's a point, same point I mentioned, uh, mentioned earlier. Uh, this is what the plot looks like. And again, you can see really just how well that data, the initial claims on employment benefits, are predicted by this sign up for unemployment uh, query. So it's really pretty useful in, uh, in that example. All right, let me give you another example where we're going to look at uh, unemployment. So this isn't initial claims, this is just the actual unemployment. So we take that tool and we look at the unemployment rate and we feed it into this Google Correlate and we say, what are predictors of the unemployment rate? And to understand what's going on here, in July 2009, the unemployment rate among young men was about 20%. So it's really very substantial. Uh, people just obviously had trouble getting summer jobs, had trouble getting regular jobs. And then that shows up in the queries, because if you look at the first set of queries that shows up as correlates of the unemployment rate, well, they're all things that have to do with unemployment. So what are companies that are hiring, job classified, Department of Labor, or working in Oregon? These are queries that have a very high correlation with the unemployment rate, not too surprising. But then the summer wears on, you still don't find a job, well then people start looking for uh, free apps. Free is very popular for unemployed. Free ringtones, uh, iPod apps, sort of tech trends. Those are very high, highly correlated with the unemployment rate. And then if we get to August and you still don't have a job, then people start looking for a guitar scales for beginner, poker hand order, home workout routine, sweepstakes, top 100 films. What is unemployment? Unemployment is unwanted leisure, right? So here's all these things you try to do to find, uh, fill up leisure. And you can probably guess what comes next is uh, <laughs> or to kissing games and all this stuff. It's not that this latter list is any shorter than the others, it's just been more heavily censored. <laughs> so, in a lot of these cases, you would expect that queries that are trying to fill up unwanted leisure, not too surprisingly, in fact, are correlates and predictors of uh, unemployment. And it's not a small effect. If you look at this labor-related, here's a series of labor-related queries and the unemployment rate, you can see that adult queries or uh, entertainment queries or game queries are very, very highly correlated with that unemployment rate, and in many of these cases, more highly correlated than the pure labor-related market, labor market queries. So, if we just try to mechanize this search for uh, predictors, one thing you can do is take the predictors that are most highly correlated with unemployment, whether they're entertainment or game or any of these other things, and try to use those to predict the unemployment rate out of, out of sample. It's one step ahead unemployment rate. Or, if you didn't want to be purely mechanical about it, you could try to do what an economist would do and pick those labor market related queries. Uh, and so these two charts show what happens if you just pick the high correlation predictors, what well, does a terrible job? Even though they're highly correlated with the contemporaneous value, you have very little predictive power. Whereas over here, if you use the labor market related predictors, you get about a 5% error, whereas just using the 60 predictors with the highest correlation, you get about a 37% error. So the moral of the story is economists are not technologically obsolete, at least yet. And uh, in fact, there is, it does seem that using judgment about uh, what might go into the model helps to some degree in coming up with a good model. So the simple correlation doesn't work and the human judgment uh, doesn't scale. 
So how are we going to use this data? How are we going to solve this fat regression uh, problem? So uh, let me give you the way that we do it. And I want to emphasize, I think this is very, very much a research question. So I'm not saying that we've solved this problem by any means. There are lots of different approaches. And uh, I would like to encourage people to look into this because I think it is one of the problems we're going to face in many, many subjects uh, in the next few years because of this huge abundance of data that we have now. So what we do is we uh, sort of estimate the time series part of the data, the univariate time series using a Coleman filter technique. There's something called a basic structural model allows you to decompose the series into this uh, trend plus seasonal plus noise uh, time series decomposition. That's a flexible, adaptive, nicely interpretable way to uh, look at time series. And then for model selection, we use something called a spike and slab Bayesian regression. And the terminology there comes from the uh, idea that the probability that a variable is in the regression, there's a prior distribution on that, so that's the spike, and then conditional on being in the regression, we've got a uniform di or a, a diffuse distribution about uh, what value it takes on, and then we estimate a posterior probability that a variable's in the model and the uh, value it takes on. Well, that's a Bayesian technique, and it combines quite nicely with that uh, Coleman filter, which is also easily interpretable as a Bayesian technique. And then what we do for our final forecast, instead of coming out with one best model, which is uh, a tempting thing to do, but usually a wrong thing to do, what we do is we take a weighted average of all the models that we've uh, explored. So it's, you're generally better off in doing prediction by using model averaging than you are by trying to get a single uh, best model. And in our case, since you've got a posterior probability for each of the models that we explore, we take a weighted average using those uh, posterior probabilities. Now that's frustrating from a scientific point of view because from a scientific point of view, people like to say, my model's the best. And he says, my model's the best. And so they'll have this uh, debate about who has the best model. But if you're just interested in, in forecasting, it's often better to be agnostic about the best model, look at several different models, and then use the, uh, use the average. And uh, this addresses the problems I alluded to, that the Kalman filter, you're taking out the time series part of the regression, so we're using that to, uh, sorry, of the uh, series, so we're using that to whiten the series, and we use this spike and slab to do the variable selection, and uh, we try to avoid overfitting by picking a number of small models, which are then averaged together, rather than trying to pick one uh, monolithic model. And there's, the, uh, I don't have time to go into some of the specific details, but I do want to show you what happens if you apply this method. Um, and uh, I look at it, uh, look at the University of Michigan consumer sentiment data, that's monthly data from the telephone survey of consumers. They ask these very specific questions about consumer sentiment. And uh, what we did is we took 157 economic verticals from the Google data, and I defined what economic meant. That was using human judgment. We looked at their average value for the first two weeks of the month. So two weeks through the month, we tried to come up with a forecast of what consumer sentiment would look like for that month. And that's about three weeks before the data is actually released. Here's the recession, of course. The sentiment comes back up. This is last summer when we had the budget impasse that really depressed everybody. And you can see that quite strongly in the consumer sentiment index. So what happens if you, uh, if you plug this into the model I just described? Well, the best predictor, single predictor, was this uh, uh, retirement and pension related queries. People were checking on their 401ks as they saw them collapse during that recession. That's a positive predictor, and that shows up at about 70% of the models that we looked at. This is the inclusion probability here. Uh, negative predictors were business news, not too surprising. Uh, this is hybrid and alternative vehicles. 
And if you look at uh, lots of U.S. data, uh, this shows up pretty strongly as a negative predictor. The reason is the price of gasoline, because it's well known that consumer sentiment is rather <laughs> sensitive to the price of gasoline. When consumers are feeling good, they're searching for trucks and SUVs, and when they're feeling squeezed, they're searching for hybrid alternative vehicles. And then here we have economic-related queries. Well, it's a negative predictor. The more people look for economic-related topics, the worse off they probably are. It uh, really is the dismal science from this, uh, from this picture. And then uh, product reviews, which is a positive predictor. And uh, currencies of foreign exchange, negative predictor. And it goes on. I mean, the, remember that we just have a whole bunch of different models these uh, particular probabilities. Uh, it turns out that if you use that uh, model, uh, you can get about an 8% improvement on the predictability of this uh, U.S. Consumer Sentiment Index by looking at those Google uh, queries. This is one picture using the baseline model, simple auto regression, using the, uh, uh, those predictors. Uh, gives you definite improvement. Here's another picture where we're using, this is the posterior distribution of the uh, consumer sentiment, and then the blue circles are the actual values of consumer sentiment, and here we get about an 8% improvement in the one month ahead uh, uh, mean absolute there. I say one month to the data release, or sorry, three weeks, I should be saying, to the time the data is actually uh, released. And one nice thing you can do with this is you can do a little decomposition into the posterior distribution for the trend, which is here, and then this is the extra value added by the regression. The actual prediction is the sum of these two pieces, so you can see how much of it is coming from the predicting variables and how much is just coming from the trend extrapolation. Uh, there isn't a seasonal component here because it's not a big issue for this, uh, for this data. All right, so I think I have about three minutes left. I'm going to tell you one last thing, which is uh, totally different than anything I've said before, but it's aimed towards the same goal, and then I'll try to tie the two things uh, together. One other thing that we have at Google, which is kind of long, is this Google product search, which is a gigantic database of millions of products along with their description and the prices. So when I looked at this and played around with it, I said, hey, you know what? We can build our own price index. So we can build, instead of the CPI, the Consumer Price Index, we can build the GPI, the Google Price Index, just by running a query over this database. And indeed, what you can do is do the same methodology that the, uh, that the Census Bureau does when they construct this, uh, this price index. And uh, here's what it looks like. Great thing is, instead of having a monthly series on prices, we have a daily series of prices, or in this case, a weekly series. So if you look at it, the red line, which has circles every month, that's a CPI for computers. And then here, black line, which has circles every week, that's a CPI based on the Google Shopping Index. Mm -hmm. So you can see it really aligns extremely well. Here's the same thing for software where you've got the government categories and the uh, Google categories for software. Here's cameras, which again has the same general shape. And here's food, which fails miserably, because after all, not many people buy their food online. This is gourmet food or something up here. And this is what the, uh, the figures uh, look like for the Google data. So basically, our experience has been that if you look at uh, things that are commonly sold online, cameras, watches, uh, computers, software, games, etc., you get a reading really quite nice alignment with what the official numbers look like. And you get it in high frequency, right? You're getting it on either a weekly or sometimes a daily basis. Okay, so now I said I want to tie these two themes together, and that's the challenge for the future. The private sector has a lot of real-time high-frequency data. Uh, think of the credit card companies uh, with MasterCard. You can go buy from MasterCard their spending pulse data, which shows you the charges on MasterCard on a daily basis by region and by category. 
U.S. and FedEx uh, report that shipments, Walmart, Target has real-time data systems. They can see how much was sold in a store yesterday. Supermarket scanner data is widely available. And of course, search engines, which I've, which I've talked about here. And by contrast, in the government, they've got these long historical series that are very carefully constructed, but they tend to be low frequency, uh, subject to revision, and of course, they're very labor intensive. So the natural thing to do, which I think is a challenge for economists uh, and for operations researchers and all sorts of anal analysts, is to try to combine these data sources so we can get more accurate, better real-time data, understanding the state of your industry, or understanding the state of the economy, and uh, try to get the best of uh, both worlds. So how do you integrate the massive amounts of private sector real-time information with the traditional uh, government statistics. I've shown you one way using the data we have, and I'm sure you have access to lots of other data, and I urge you to take a look at this. Okay, thank you very much.